Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are on the third Sunday in Advent. We light the joy candle today. We're looking down at the manger, just waiting for that baby to show up. Just a couple of more weeks, or minutes if you're staying for the pageant, and we celebrate the Messiah's birth again. We know that deep joy, that fruit of the Spirit that comes from being sure of God's love through Jesus Christ. It is the joy that keeps us from despair even though things are not what they are supposed to be. The news is full of murder and drugs and poverty and war. There are more cases of cancer than we can count. And people are in the hospital dying this very minute. The Messiah was born 2,000 years ago. Shouldn't this all be fixed by now? If you're wondering just what's going on, you're in good company now and back in the first century. Imagine this scene. Jesus is teaching in one of the cities where the disciples have already been, so the crowds are big. He's surrounded by a crowd when some men approach through the throng. They aren't just curious bystanders. They are messengers from John the Baptist himself, Jesus' cousin. John has been proclaiming repentance, baptism, and the coming of the Messiah in the wilderness for years. Last week, Pastor Ben told us that even some of the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to John for baptism to be cleansed of their sins. But the unthinkable has happened. John's outspoken position against sin had gotten him in trouble with the local ruler, Herod Antipas, or more specifically, his wife, Herodias. And John was sitting in Herod's palace in prison under a death sentence. When John's disciples came to the imprisoned John with reports of Jesus' activities, John sent back a message. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? The historian Josephus reports that there were 40 different men who claimed to be the Messiah at the time of Jesus. So John's question wasn't as crazy as it sounds. Jesus, are you the one we're looking for? Now, just a few chapters ago, John baptized Jesus in the Jordan. He was protesting the whole time. I need you to baptize me. He saw the Holy Spirit come down, descending like a dove. And he heard a voice from heaven announce, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. John the prophet, the one in the animal skins, living in the wilderness, eating bugs, was vindicated. The Messiah was here, and he was going to fix everything. But Jesus wasn't doing what the Messiah was supposed to do. He was supposed to be leading an armed revolt against the occupiers. The Romans were supposed to be gone. Judea was supposed to be back in the hands of God's chosen one. The new king from David's house was supposed to be on the throne. God's kingdom was supposed to be ushered in. Isn't that what a Messiah is supposed to do? And now John is in prison at the hands of a leader the Romans put in place. Is it any wonder that John might be starting to doubt that Jesus, the healer and compassionate teacher, was not the one they were looking for. You know, Jesus doesn't answer the messenger's question directly. He rarely does. Instead, he asks John's disciples to report back to John what they've seen. Then they recall the words of the prophet Isaiah, which John would have known. 
the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. Jesus adds, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news brought to them. Not in the very words of Isaiah, but certainly what he had in mind in verses 6 through 8 of our Old Testament reading. The waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of the jackals shall become a swamp and the grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way and the unclean shall not travel on it. But it shall be for God's people, and no traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. The parched desert will be reborn, and there will be a road for God's people to follow home that no one can miss. And Jesus' words to John, blessed are those who take no offense at me, or do not fall away from me, is a reminder to John that the agenda belongs to God, and also an encouragement to keep the faith in the one who has sustained him in the wilderness for all this time. John the Baptist was the last great prophet. But in this case, I wonder if John missed the message. John proclaimed repentance or else. Instead, Jesus came to heal and teach and proclaim the good news of a restored relationship with God. John knew about God's holiness. John knew about God's justice. But John wouldn't live to see the cross. John wouldn't live to see the love of God win the day, to win eternity. And that's how Jesus could say that the greatest prophet the world would ever see is still eclipsed by the least in the kingdom of heaven. The host of heaven would see it all and rejoice. And so can we. The things that Jesus did in that city where John's disciples found him, he still does. In him, we who are blind to the truth about ourselves and our neighbors and God will have our eyes opened. In him, we who cannot remain on the right path by our own power are strengthened. In him, we who suffer with the disease of self-absorption are cleansed. And in him, we who are deaf to the voices of conscience and God begin to listen. And in him, we who are dead and powerless in sin are raised to new life. In him, the poorest people inherit the riches of the love of God. No, John wouldn't live to see lives transformed by the power of God's love, filled with joy and granted gifts to start making the world what it's supposed to be. But along with the heavenly host, we live in the love poured out on us by the one we find in the manger, on the cross, and outside the empty tomb. Was Jesus the Messiah they were looking for? No, he wasn't. But Jesus was and is the Messiah we all need. Amen. <laughs>